in a couple of moments we will begin our Copernicus lecture, which is delivered this year by George Ellis, an eminent cosmologist. The title of his talk is on the nature of cosmology today. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce both uh, cosmology and George Ellis, and they are very strictly linked with each other. First, let's begin with, uh, with cosmology. Uh, cosmology went a long way, starting from the first Einstein wor work in 1917 till today. Uh, roughly speaking, I would divide the history of, us, of cosmology in the 20th century into the following chapters, so to speak. The first chapter could be entitled Geometry of the Universe, because physics of the universe was at its infancy at that time. Starting from Einstein's first work, scientists were looking for new solutions to Einstein equations, cosmological solutions, which represented various cosmological models, and they discussed and studied geometry of those models. Physics of that epoch, physics of the universe, was dominated completely by philosophy, by philosophical assumptions on which uh, the first cosmological models were based. This phase ended, roughly speaking, in the 60s of the previous century, and uh, for next few decades, cosmolo cosmologists were working on what is today called standard cosmological model. So it was uh, the period in which this standard cosmological model was established. Then there is a next stage of development of cosmology. I would call it precision cosmology, and some people really call that that way. Precision, precision cosmology because various cosmological parameters like density of the universe, age of the universe, cosmological constant and so forth uh, were measured or from, from observational data. And this, um, this uh, period is continuing up, up to today. Uh, we are collecting more and more data about the physical universe. I would say that the influx of observational data from various satellites and other cosmological problems is such a, such a big one that it's very hard to swallow theoretically all that stuff. But in the last days, in this today, in this title of, of George's talk, uh, the cosmology enters into the next stage, which somehow mm, is combined with this precision cosmology. This, this new trends, I would call going beyond, going beyond standards. This is inflationary cosmology. This is looking for, mm, uh, for quantum cosmology. There are speculations about um, multiverse mm, uh, and so on. This is, roughly speaking, the picture of cosmology from its beginning till today. And uh, I would say that George Ellis is strictly linked with all these stages. If we look at George Ellis' works, we can find in, in the list of these works some very eminent uh, review papers concerning the first phase of cosmology. If somebody wants to learn uh, the geometry of the universe, the, the good place to, to, to lay, uh, learn from uh, George's works in, the, in that field. Uh, this first stage of the development of cosmology ended with a very eminent monograph on the singular behavior of the universe. I mean the classical work by Steve Hawking and George Ellis, 
the book entitled The Large Scale Structure of the Universe. Many philosophical discussions about the initial singularity uh, were uh, well replaced by strict mathematical results uh, concerning uh, some th uh, theorems, mathematical theorems about the appearance of uh, singu singularities in cosmological models. George Ellis also took an active part in establishing what is called standard model of the universe. Especially, he was uh, interested and contributed a lot towards the methodological aspect of cosmological models. I remember his program to construct a mathematical apparatus of cosmology based uniquely, only, on observation of observational data. So uh, th this was a huge uh, program, a very important one. And uh, now in this going beyond cosmology, I would also consult everybody who is interested in, in that vast field of speculation surrounding cosmology in looking uh, for, for some la last works of George Ellis. Uh, I would call him the truest guardian of theoretical purity of cosmology. I, I will quote only one example. There is a lot of speech today about uh, multiverse ideo ideology. And people are speculated about the parallel universes, perhaps infinite number of them. And almost every, everything which can be said about this um, multiverse um, ideology is derived from some statistical uh, or, or probabilistic considerations regarding this multiverse models. And uh, George Ellis wrote a couple of papers dealing with how to define probabilistic measure on the space of all possible universes in order to render that concept meaningful. So uh, this is a, only one example how George Ellis applies sound methodological principles on uh, newer uh, speculations. Well, it is George Ellis who will present the nature of cosmology today, not myself. Therefore, there is high time to give the floor to, to George, honorary guest of our conference. Please, George. Well, it's a great privilege to be here, to be asked to give this lecture, and thank you for that very positive uh, discussion. Um, so what I want to do is I want to talk about the nature of cosmology today, and I'm going to have five parts to this talk. Firstly, cosmology is today a precision science with masses of high-quality data, uh, ever increasing our understanding of the physical universe, and I will summarize that because I'm assuming that some of you are not cosmologists. Secondly, paradoxically, theoretical cosmology is increasingly proposing theories based on ever more hypothetical physics or that are even untestable in principle sometimes, and so I will discuss that a little bit. Thirdly, we are also seeing ever more dogmatic claims about how scientific cosmology can solve philosophical problems that have been with us for millennia, and so I will say something about that. Fourthly, this leads to what is and what is not testable in scientific cosmology, which is something I've been thinking about for many decades. And finally, what can we make of recent claims made about how scientific cosmology relates to issues of meaning? So to start with the first part, the universe is of vast scale. It's expanding. It started off in a hot Big Bang. Structures such as galaxy clusters formed by gravitational attraction and stars and planets formed in this environment. Now that is a summary of a huge amount of work that has been done by a huge number of very, very talented people. None of these are obvious. So here's a star cluster in our own galaxy, a couple of hundred million stars. Here is a section of the Milky Way, our own galaxy seen 
edged on. Now, our own galaxy is like the Andromeda galaxy, which is this galaxy here, 100,000 million stars. You must ignore these stars. These are all in our own galaxy. So ignore this kind of veil of stars and look at the structure there, the Andromeda galaxy. It's about 50,000 light years across, which is about the same size as our own galaxy. It has two satellite galaxies. Now, to scale that, you must remember that the Earth to the Sun is eight light minutes. The Proxima Centauri, the nearest star, is four light years, and so this is 50,000 light years. And the solar system is incredibly small and insignificant compared with our galaxy. This is Andromeda. If it was our galaxy, that is roughly where we would be. We're way out towards the outside edge. And that previous picture was looking from there, looking inwards towards the center of the galaxy. So this is our own habitat, our own galaxy. But there are millions and millions of galaxies we can see out there. They're very, very beautiful. These are interacting galaxies. Galaxies occur in clusters. There are a very large number of galaxies in clusters. This is the Hubble Deep Field. And this is a star, but everything else you can see there is a galaxy. Each of those tiny blue dots is a galaxy. And these great surveys we are now getting, these are surveys of particular parts of the skies. You can see thousands and thousands of galaxies with great walls and great voids. And we have, in fact, believed that we can see of the order of 100,000 million galaxies in the observable part of the universe, each with 100,000 million stars. And a huge number of those will have planets around them. So the Earth and this room are insignificantly small in this context. That's what is there. Now, what has been happening in terms of dynamics? The very famous paper by Hubble, 1929, he took the redshifts of galaxies. What you do is you take the spectrum of a, star, of a galaxy, you spread it out through a prism, and you get it going from violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. You compare it with the laboratory, and you find these are these lines in the galaxy which are shifted. And the further away the galaxy is, the further they're shifted. That says it's moving away from us, the famous Doppler shift effect. Hubble was estimating the distance of the galaxy by its apparent size and the velocity from the redshift, which is shown these arrows. These arrows are bigger and bigger. As they get bigger, the, the galaxy size is getting smaller. And so Hubble plotted it to scientists too in a graph. And there is the velocity against the distance. And it's pretty much a straight line. And that is the very famous Hubble relation that velocity is proportional to distance. In other words, the universe is expanding. Galaxies are getting further and further apart from each other. So now you take Einstein's field equations, which says that gravity tries to pull things together. Kinetic energy tries to let them go apart. And which one wins? And in the universe, this is the scale of the universe against time. And there are three possibilities. If the gravity wins, there's not enough kinetic energy. The universe expands. Gravity wins and pulls it back. So over time, that universe recollapses. And it turns out those have positively curved space sections. If there is not enough matter, if there's the kinetic energy wins, the universe expands forever. And it turns out those have negatively curved space sections. And in between, the ones which are on the verge of recollapsing, they are the delicate ones which just managed to expand, are these ones with flat three space sections. Now, we measure that in terms of something called the density parameter. It's the density of matter divided by three times the rate of expansion squared. And that parameter is one for those values. It is less than one for those, and it is greater than one for those. So there's this para density parameter normalized by the expansion. And one of the big things cosmologists want to know is, will the universe expand forever? Will it recollapse? What is going to happen to it? And in fact, uh, we still don't know if the universe is negatively curved or positively curved or has flat spatial sections. That's one of the things we still don't know. Now, some new discoveries from the past decay, couple of decades. This got the Nobel Prize last year. We could use supernova in distant galaxies as standard candles. What happens is at the end of their lives, stars, big stars, 
start to collapse, a huge explosion takes place, blows them apart. You can see that as a supernova which becomes very bright in the sky and those can be used to estimate distance. They are standard candles because their maximum brightness is correlated to their decay rate. Now, you measure their redshifts, it's the same as Hubble did, and these give the first reliable detection of nonlinearity. In other words, Hubble put a straight line and we wanted to know, did this curve bend up or did it bend down? And we all assumed before this data came in that the curve was going to bend down. In other words, that gravity would be winning and slowing down the expansion of the universe. But these redshifts gave the first reliable detection of this nonlinearity of the bending and they showed it bends up which shows the universe is currently accelerating. The expansion is getting faster and faster, and that was a totally unexpected result which caught the whole astronomical community by surprise. What it means is there's an effective cosmological constant that is a repulsive force which is making the universe ex ex accelerate, the expansion accelerate. And remember, the critical value of matter was one, this is 0.7, which means that seven-tenths of the matter in the universe, of the energy in the universe, is this dark energy. And we do not know what it is. It may be a cosmological constant or it may be some unknown form of matter. So one of the big th things in cosmology, we are pretty convinced there is this dark energy and we do not know what it is or why it is there. The second great discovery of fairly recent times is that the rotation curves of galaxies, the motion of galaxies, indicate the presence of dark matter. You look at galaxies, how are they moving, and you use Newton's theory of gravity to work out how much matter there should be. You compare it with the motion, and you find the matter you see is not enough to explain what you see. Unseen matter does not radiate changes the motion, it's felt through its gravitational field, but we can't see it. Now, actually, that's not very surprising if you think about it. If there's a lot of matter out there, there's no particular reason why all of it should be radiating. In other words, there's no particular reason why we should see all of it by the light it emits. And the density of dark matter varies with scale, but cosmologically, it's about 0.3. Remember, the critical density is one, so about three-tenths of the stuff out there is dark matter. But the really amazing thing, the thing we never expected, is that the luminous, the visible matter, is about 0.02 in these terms. It's a very small fraction of the amount which we have determined. And what has been, by comparing what we find from these curves with what we know from nuclear synthesis, which I'll talk shortly, we find that virtually all of the matter this, so we've got the energy, the dark energy. We've also got the dark matter. The dark energy pushes things apart. The dark matter pulls things together. This is about 0.3. The amount of ordinary matter, the kind of matter which is in the room, is roughly speaking of this order, 0 0.02. And most of the dark matter is not ordinary matter. It's completely different from the matter in this room. And there's a huge industry out there trying to puzzle out what is the nature of this dark matter which is most of the matter in the universe. So that's the second great discovery of recent times. Firstly, dark energy. Secondly, dark matter. And the way we work out the dark matter typically is this is a galaxy uh, going across, looking across the galaxy, the distance from the center, and these are the rotation velocities which you measure by redshift. The measured amount is there, the visible matter accounts for that much, and the difference is dark matter. So this is the typical kind of data you use. Okay, so this is recent times. Now, follow the universe backwards. It was moving apart, so going towards the past, it was coming together. Well, when a gas is compressed, it gets hotter and hotter, so the universe was hotter and hotter in the past. And if you follow it back using standard physics, you can predict it will heat up, and hence there was a hot Big Bang era in the early universe. The thing was like a very, very hot expanding gas. When there's a very hot expanding gas like that, eventually gets hot enough that the matter and radiation are in equilibrium and it generates black body radiation. This is a standard form of radiation which is given out by any very, very hot black body. And this was established by Max Planck and other physicists about the turn of the last century, well over 100 years ago. And we've measured this radiation. That was the Nobel Prize for work done in 1965. We find it is there today at a, pre a temperature of 2.75 Kelvin. That is minus 270 degrees centigrade. It's just a few degrees above absolute zero. It's very, very cold, which is why it's very difficult to detect. 
And this radiation has got a characteristic blackbody spectrum, for those of you who know about that. What that means is quite astonishing. It means that quantum physics as we know it today was applicable, exactly the same physics was applicable to the universe 14,000 million years ago. It checks for us that physics hasn't changed in any serious sense over the lifetime of the observable universe. This radiation reaches us from what we call the surface of last scattering at a temperature about 4,000 degrees. I'll give you a picture of that in a minute. But one of the major, major things which has been done was to look across the sky. And this is a map of the whole sky. Imagine the whole sky around us flattened out onto this, this um, two-dimensional screen. These uh, are the hot parts and the cold parts. Now, this is our own galaxy. Do you remember that picture of our galaxy? Well, this is our own galaxy seen in this radiation. So this is near us. But the rest of what you're seeing is the surface of large scattering. It's when this radiation got free from matter about 14,000 million years ago. And at that time, certain spots were hotter and certain spots were cooler. The hotter spots are going to form huge, great big cl um, clusters of galaxies in the future. The cooler spots will form great big voids. So these are primeval perturbations which provide the initial data for the structures we see about us today. Now this is the little picture. This is time going from the left to right. It's the size of the universe. So the universe gets very, very large, and then it goes rather slow. I'll talk about this in just a minute. So time goes from left to right. Elementary particles combine to give protons at these very early times. So we start here going to the right. Elementary particles give protons and neutrons. Then light elements are formed here three minutes after the Big Bang. This is, happens very, very fast. This is a logarithmic scale with time compressed on the left and expanding on the right. This is the large scattering surface. At earlier times, the universe was opaque. The matter and radiation were interacting with each other so that radiation couldn't ma move more than a few centimeters before it collided. But then the matter and radiation decoupled, the universe became transparent, and the cosmic background radiation was let free at this time, the surface of large scattering. And that's what we measure today, the graph I just showed you in the last slide. And so this is where atoms were formed. Before that, you had a plasma. Atoms were formed. There was a dark era, and then the first um, stars and galaxies formed, and then later stars and galaxies formed, and we are up here today. So this is a compressed scale, the start of the universe, the formation of the, the first particles, the formation of the first light elements, decoupling of matter and radiation, the beginnings of stars and galaxies, and then present-day stars and galaxies. Now. One of the things we understand by using nuclear physics is the origin of the elements. Nuclear physics processes, as I mentioned in the last slide, during the hot Big Bang era, started a process of nucleosynthesis when hydrogen, uh, nitrogen and um, sorry, protons and neutrons fused together to form the light elements in the very early universe. This was at about a temperature of 10 to the 9th degrees Kelvin when neutrons and protons converged combined to form light nuclei. Now, one of the things which was found is the heavy elements cannot be formed in the early universe. Now, that's of considerable importance to us because we are made of heavy elements. So we are made of heavy elements which were not there. If you go back to this last slide, at this time here, all that was there was hydrogen, helium, and tiny bits of lithium and deuterium. There wasn't any carbon. There wasn't any nitrogen. So these first stars could not have planets, they couldn't have people around them because they weren't heavy, heavy elements. What happens is the heavy elements formed in the interior of stars. In the inside of stars, elements cooked through nuclear reactions made carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and so on. And these were then spread through space by the supernova explosions I've already mentioned. Then the remnants of those supernova explosions could then condense again and form second generation stars, and those stars and the planets around them did have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and that's where our elements that we are made from came from. And so that's the basis of the crucial elements of life and the phrase which you probably have heard, we are all made of stardust. The elements we are made of were cooked up in the interiors of stars. Now, that's the origin of ele elements. Even earlier than the hot Big Bang era, what happened? Well. In the very early universe, particle physics plays a major role. Quantum field theory, the theory of incredibly small particles and fields, 
allowed negative gravitational mass. So our expectation that things will slow down wasn't true at that very early time. At that very early time, quantum fields could make things blow apart incredibly fast in a very, very short time. And that's what's called inflation. Inflation took place incredibly early after the hot Big Bang, the start of the universe, with expansion rapidly accelerating through a huge amount of e-foldings, that's a great many multiples, before the hot Big Bang era. And it's now, this is now the standard model of cosmology. There was this incredibly rapid expansion followed by the hot Big Bang era, followed by the dark era and the creation of galaxies and stars and structures. And chaotic inflation predicts pockets of inflation surround ordinary expanding universe regions resulting in an overall fractal-like structure. I'll talk about that in just a minute. At the end of inflation, the field which caused it decays into matter and radiation as is the start of the matter we see around us. So this is the, grace of the summary here. You start off on the left, you've seen this already. Uh, something happens there I'll talk about in a minute. Inflation takes place and then all of those processes I've talked about take place. And uh, This is plotted in a slightly different scale. We are up here with an age of about 14 billion years. So we have a concordance model of cosmology. I've shown you that, the microwave background. What this is, the, the cosmologist, one of the great triumphs of cosmology was inflationary theory predicted that if we analyze this into the power on different angular scales. Now this is the power on different scales, large scales on the left, small scales on the right, and theorists predicted we should see a series of peaks and observations then found those peaks. And that's what science loves, prediction, which is then verified. And this happened in cosmology. These peaks in the power spectrum were predicted. And so the standard of model, model of cosmology has got the dark matter density 0.3, the cosmological constant 0.7, and it agrees with lensing, matter power, spectral velocities. It all fits together in a good standard model. The puzzles, the nature of dark matter, the nature of dark energy. So it's really important to ask, are there alternatives? And I could talk about that, but that's not my subject today. The details of galaxy formation, the details of the matter-radiation interaction and structure growth, there's a huge industry looking at all this. Is it fully consistent when we take nonlinear things into account? That's what a lot of people are looking for. And the nature of the inflaton, I talked about this inflationary era, but we don't know what the inflaton was. So we've got three really big puzzles. We don't know dark matter, we don't know dark energy, we don't know what the inflaton was. So it's really important to also look for alternatives to inflation. But many new observations are taking place, deep surveys, cosmic background radiation, polarization observations. There's a vast amount of fantastic work going on with new observations, new surveys for all of these things, trying to sort out the dark matter, the dark energy, the details of structural formation, the nature of inflation, and the big new thing that will happen is gravitational wave observations are hoped to come in and play a role in this in the future. Okay, that's the standard cosmology. Now, where the really controversial starts is let's start asking what happened even before inflation. What happened before inflation? And this is where we run into quantum cosmology. The, the question of what did gravity look like at the very, very high energies and very, very small scales when quantum theory has to be taken into account. So quantum effects will dominate, and the problem is we don't have a proper theory of quantum gravity. We've just been talking about that in the meeting that is going on at the moment. And there have been many attempts to describe quantum cosmology, something called the wave function of the universe, something called pre-Big Bang theory, something called brain cosmology, something called the expirotic universe. This is a straightforward attempt to use the Schrodinger equation, more or less. This is based on idea of string theories. This is the idea that our universe is a four-dimensional space embedded in a higher dimensional space time, and so on. So there's lots of these theories. That the main point I want to say is in all cases, the problem is making a solid link to observational tests, because in every case, the proposed particle interactions and extension of classical gravity is not testable. So all of those theories I've just mentioned are hypothetical. They may or may not be true. The, the theories are indirectly testable via their effects on inflation and the microwave background spectrum, but there is no fully formulated theory of quantum gravity. So as we follow back, we understand things back very well to nucleosynthesis. We more or less understand inflation. Before that, we are in an area of speculation. 
okay? And in particular, we actually don't know if there was a start to the universe or not. One of the biggest questions of all, has the universe existed forever or not? And some theories of quantum gravity say there was no start, others say there was. We don't even know yet, at the present time, if the universe had a beginning or not. What we're running into is what I call the physics horizon. The problem is there's a limit to what's testable in the laboratory and in the solar system. We can only test up to certain energies. The LHC, you've all heard about, the collider that's making these huge discoveries. It's got a certain energy. It's a very, very high energy, but it isn't as high as is relevant to the very early universe. And we can't build the big enough accelerators because our gross natural product isn't big enough, <laughs> let alone any other problem. So we have to extrapolate known physics to domains when the physics that we're applying to the universe is untested and may be untestable. This is the physics horizon. You can extrapolate in different ways from known physics to what's relevant there and the outcomes will be different. So uncertainty increases in the very early universe, testability declines, and particularly theories of creation of the universe cannot be tested. I will return to that in a minute. Now, paradoxically, theoretical cosmology is increasingly proposing theories based on ever more hypothetical physics because for the reasons I've just said, and even ones that are untestable in principle, and the prime one is the idea of the multiverse, the claim that what we can see, all the stuff I've been showing you, is just one tiny fragment of a very, very much bigger set of multiple universes, each with different physics and different things happening in them. Now, some people claim this is the inevitable outcome of the physical originating processes that generated our universe. This thing called chaotic inflation says there are billions and billions, they even say an infinite number of similar bubbles out there, but with different rates of expansion, different amount of matter, different constants of physics. Some people see this as a result of a philosophical position. The philosophical position says anything that can happen must happen. Anything which is possible is obligatory. And some people believe that's a basic underlying philosophical position. Uh, the third reason, and perhaps one of the most common ones nowadays, is it's proposed as an explanation for why our universe appears to be fine-tuned for life and consciousness. This is taken as an explanation for why we, human beings, can exist. So the existence of these multiple universes is because of what's called fine-tuning. Now, the universe is fine-tuned for life, firstly as regards the laws of physics. If you mess around with the laws of physics, if you change the fine structure constant, if you change the strength of a nuclear force too much, one way or the other, we won't exist because atoms won't exist. If you change the boundary conditions for the universe, if you make it too lumpy to begin with, everything would have collapsed into black holes, there wouldn't be any galaxies. If you make it too smooth, there wouldn't be any galaxies. You've got to get the amount of inhomogeneity in the early universe right, or we wouldn't be here. The constants of physics must be um, in the right, and particularly this dark energy. Most people think it's a cosmological constant, this acceleration. If that acceleration was very much bigger, that would have won in the early universe, gravity would never have won, and galaxies wouldn't have existed, we wouldn't be here. On the other hand, if it was too big and negative, the universe would, would have done a big wump, a big crash, and there wouldn't have been time for us to come into existence. So you've got to get the, the laws of physics right, you've got to get the boundary conditions right, and you've got to get the constants of physics right in order that we can exist. So the question is, the philosophical question, why? Did the laws of physics turn out to be of such a nature that we would come into being as a result of an evolutionary process? If you get the laws of physics wrong or the boundary conditions wrong, no evolution process of any kind will ever start to take place. Now, the physical explanation which a lot of my colleagues are proposing is a multiverse. You think of these billions of universes and each of them the laws of physics may be different, the boundary conditions may be different, the constants of nature be different. And if you think, if you imagine scattering around billions of universes out there with all of these things varying, then you will be lucky somewhere. <laughs> things will work out right somewhere and life will come to exist somewhere out there just by pure luck. So an infinite set of universe domains allows all possibilities to occur so somewhere things will work out okay. That's the basic way that the multiverse is used to explain why our universe allows life to exist. Now I emphasize it must be an actually existing multiverse. This is essential. You, to think of hypothetical ones doesn't help. For this to work as an explanation, these other multiverses, these other universes must actually be there. 
And cosmic Martin Rees, in his book, Our Cosmic Habitat, says, Rees explores the notion that our universe is just part of a vast multiverse or ensemble of universes, in which most of the other universes are lifeless. What we call the laws of nature would then be no more than local bylaws imposed of the art or math of our own Big Bang. In this scenario, our cosmic habitat would be a special, possibly unique universe where the prevailing laws of physics allowed life to emerge. That's the philosophy of this project. The problem is there's no chance of testing it. The universe domains involved are beyond possible observation and not only now but for the conceivable future. The furthest we can see is the matter which emitted the micro background radiation. There's a huge amount of matter beyond that. We can't receive it because there hasn't been time for light to reach us since the beginning of the universe. This is the visual horizon. The supposed physics is also untestable. So some people claim that this must happen because the physics will make it happen. Well, the physics they're talking about is not tested, has not been tested, and is in most cases not ever going to be testable physics. So not only can you not observe it, but the physics isn't testable either. In fact, the main reason it's pursued, in my view, is because it's a good explanation of fine-tuning. That is, it's pursued for philosophical reasons and Many people like Steven Weinberg, Martin Rees are quite explicit in this. They are pursuing it because it provides them with an explanation of fine-tuning and therefore it is the only scientific explanation they can see of why the universe is friendly for life, allows life to exist. So you see, what has happened here is the requirement that science should be tested has been downgraded relative to the requirement that science should explain. Science you wanted to do, be testable and to explain. And so what is happening here is that what these people are saying is don't worry too much that it's not testable. It's a very good explanation, therefore you should believe it. So I ask whether that is science or whether that is philosophy. The big issue is that the very nature of the scientific enterprise is at stake in the multiverse debate. The multiverse proponents are proposing weakening the nature of scientific proof in order to claim that multiverses provide a scientific explanation. They're doing so by saying, don't worry about testability, it's a really good explanation. <laughs> well, that's pretty dangerous because that takes us back to before we started the experimental testing. Anybody can have an hypothesis, which is a very good explanatory hypothesis. The whole point, what made science so successful was testing. So they're now proposing untestable theories and say, don't worry about that. Well, I think that's pretty dangerous. And in any case, it doesn't solve the ultimate issues, as I will mention shortly. And again, I emphasize we're concerned with really existing multiverses, not potential or hypothetical. There's no problem with potential or hypothetical ones. The question is, does it really exist out there? It's, I think it's quite ironic when people who, on the one hand, insist that the virtue of science is testability, on the other hand, strongly support a multiverse to explain fine-tuning. I'm thinking particularly of the writing in a recent book by Richard Dawkins, uh, by, by Dawkins in which he says this provides a scientific explanation of why the universe is fine-tuned for life. Now, Dawkins claims that the virtue of science is testability, but he doesn't think that that is so applicable in the case of cosmology, which is a really interesting thing. I think we must not revert to theory trumping observational tests. I think that takes us back 2,000 years to the pre-Galileo time. I think it's a huge step backwards. I think we must insist that science is about testability. Now, I've had debates with Bill Sturger and others about just how much testability you need, but if you abandon testability, then I think you have left science and you are in the realm of philosophy. Now. Let's take this a step further. Many worlds in one, the search for other universes by Alex Vilenkin. He goes on to posit our universe is but one of an infinite series, many of, whom, many of whom are populated by our clones. And he's taking infinity, he means infinity when he says this. Some of the, these multiverse enthusiasts, they don't just say there's a huge number, they say there's an infinite number. Vilenkin is well aware of the implication of this assertion. Countless identical civilizations to ours are scattered in the infinite expanse of the cosmos. The humanity humankind reduced to absolute cosmic insignificance, our descent from the center of the world is now complete. The point is, if you have literally an infinite multiverse out there, the probability of there being a room exactly like this out there is one. In an exactly identical room out there, I'm saying the same thing to you, and another one I'm saying is a slightly different thing to you. But once you have a probability of one of another room like this being out there, there's a probability 
it's, there's an infinite number of identical rooms to this because that's the nature of infinity. The nature of infinity is if the probability of anything is one, then there's an infinite number of identical rooms out there, exactly the same as this room and slightly different and more and more different. It is a mind-boggling claim that is being made in this book. And I think this is complete nonsense. The often claimed existence of physically existing infinities of universes, spatial sections, and so on, is dubious. Now, and Bill Sturgers helped me really clarify my, my mind on this. Firstly, in fact, if you look at their models, this never happens in a finite time. In fact, the universe is always tending towards this number, but it never, ever reaches it in a finite time. And the key point is infinity is not a big number. It's an unattainable state rather than a big number. And David Hilbert said the following. The infinite is never to be found anywhere in reality. No matter what experiences, observations, and knowledge are appealed to. Hilbert, one of the greatest mathematicians ever, knew you needed infinity in mathematics, but he said it could not occur in physical reality, and I think that is correct. But the further point is that claim, that book by Vilenkin, he's putting this forward as science. Okay, So is this idea testable? It is not testable. Because the whole point about infinity, supposing there was this infinity out there, you can't see them all, but supposing you could see them, you could still not prove there was an infinite number because no matter how many you had counted, you wouldn't have proved that it was infinite because to prove it's infinity, you have to prove there is never, ever an end. And you cannot do that. And so the claim that infinities exist in the multiverse is definitely not a scientific statement, even if the multiverse does exist. Okay, we're also seeing ever more dogmatic claims about how scientific cosmology can solve philosophical problems that have been with us for millennia. And the big philosophical problem is what does it mean if we discover that our universe must have had a beginning? Supposing we in fact conclude from our theories there must have been a beginning to the universe. How did that happen? What led to it? How do we handle the idea of the creation of the universe? Well, the basic way that you can do that is to assume something in some sense pre-existed because you have to have something out of which to create something. And in fact, many of my colleagues are producing theories of the creation of the universe in which they're assuming that quantum field theories, Hilbert spaces, group theories, all sorts of things pre-existed the existence of the universe because they assume that those theories apply to the process that led to the existence of the universe. The only alternative is you give up on causation, or at least in some sense or other. One of the questions is, are there the laws for the universe itself? And the problem is there's only one universe. And the idea of a physical law is it applies to many, many similar objects. If there's only one universe, how can you talk about a law when there's only one thing for it to describe? A law that describes only one thing is a description, it's not a law. And that's one of the problems. But let, so let's go back. As I say, most of these claims are based on the idea there's a whole, the whole structure of quantum field theory is taken for granted and is assumed to lead to the creation of the universe. So where did quantum physics exist before the universe came into existence? Okay, that's the big question which is unanswered in these books. And the recent claim is the universe arose from vacuum fluctuations. Quantum field theory, the theory of the vacuum with no matter there, does not remain a vacuum. Particles bubble in and out of existence. That's one of the great discoveries of the last century. One can, can extrapolate the theory to the idea that universes might bubble out of the vacuum if the right sort of fields exist and this kind of tunneling place, place for the vacuum. And this is the idea which Hawking and Lodenlow have put forward in Lawrence Krauss in these books, The Grand Design by Stephen Hawking and Leonard Lodenlow and The Universe from Nothing by Lawrence Krauss. And the question is, what should we think of this? Now, there's a very, very interesting book review of Krauss's book by David Albert, who's professor of philosophy at, at Columbia University and a author of Quantum Mechanics and Experience. And he says as follows, Lawrence Krauss, a well-known cosmologist and prolific popular science writer, apparently means to announce to the world in this new book that the laws of quantum mechanics have in them the making of a thoroughly scientific and adamantly secular explanation of why there is something rather than nothing. Period. Case closed. End of story. Look at the subtitle. Look at how Richard Dawkins subs it up. And the, the, sorry, can we see the subtitle? Um, no, we can't. Why, why there is something rather than nothing is the subtitle. So, Krauss's book claims to 
explain why there is something rather than nothing. Look at the subtitle. Look at how Richard Dawkins sums it up in his afterword. Even the last remaining trump card of the theologian, why is there something rather than nothing, shrivels up before your eyes as you read these pages. If on the origin of species were biology's deadliest blow to supernaturalism, where we may come to see a universe from nothing is the equivalent from cosmology. The title means exactly what it says, and what it says is devastating, that the universe could come into being out of nothing. That is the claim. Well, is it in fact well-established physics? Does it solve the philosophical issues that he claims? So first, what is testable and what is not testable in cosmology? Now, this is the picture you've already seen, the time going to the left, and I just want to emphasize what I've already said, but I want to really emphasize it. Now, well-understood physics applies from there through to here. It is speculative physics at that time, and what Krauss and Hawking are presenting to you is speculative physics. It is not tested physics, it's not well-established physics. Okay? A, a great deal of what Krauss talks about is not tested, well-established physics. The stuff about creation of the universe is not testable even in principle. Equally so, the theory of the string landscape which they rely on to underlie their claims that this explains fine-tuning, that is not tested. It's not even a very well-defined theory. And the link between chaotic inflation and the string landscape is hypothetical physics. It is not tested. So what they believe is that the, 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 the constants of physics will vary because of the string theory string theory, which is the fundamental theory of quantum gravity that many people believe in. That's not a well-tested theory. In that theory, there's a theory of the quantum vacuum, which is also not a well-tested theory. And in addition, they're assuming that the inflation is linked to that quantum vacuum. That's also not tested. There are multiple layers of speculation in this. It's a nice picture, but tested physics, it is not. David Albert says as follows. Where are the laws of quantum mechanics themselves supposed to have come from? Christ is more or less upfront, as it turns out, about not having a clue about that. He acknowledges albeit in parentheses and just a few pages before the end of the book, that everything he's been talking about simply takes the basic principles of quantum mechanics for granted. I have no idea if this notion can be usefully disposed with, he writes, and at least I don't know any productive work in this regard. So the nothing, which he assumes, is in fact the entire apparatus of quantum field theory, which is not nothing by any stretch of imagination. And what if he did know of some productive work in that regard? What if he were in a position to announce, for example, that the truth of the quantum mechanical laws can be traced back to the fact that the world has some other deeper property, X? Wouldn't we still be in a position to ask why X rather than Y? And is there a last such question? Is there some point at which the possibility of asking any further such questions somehow definitively comes to an end? How would that work? What would that be like? What the fundamental laws of nature are about and all that the fundamental laws of nature are about and all that there is for the fundamental laws of nature to be about, insofar as physics has ever been able to imagine it, is how the elementary stuff described by physics is arranged. But the laws have no bearings whatsoever on questions of where the elementary stuff came from or of why the world should have consisted of that particular elementary stuff it does as opposed to something else or to nothing at all. They have nothing whatsoever to say on the subject of where these fields came from or of why the world should have consisted of the particular kinds of fields it does or of why it should have consisted of fields at all or of why there should have been a world in the first place. Period. Case closed. End of story. Albert is, Bruce, uh, Albert is saying that not only is this not well tested, these theories, but these theories can't do what Krauss is claiming. Physics cannot deal with the kind of questions to which Krauss is applying it. So what can we make of recent claims about how scientific cosmology reduces to issues of meaning? Okay, What you've got to get into is the natures of existence. And what I claim is there are physics... There are both physical realities, but there are also abstract realities out there which are important for the universe. Firstly, is the physical laws. The laws of physics control what happens in the universe. And one of the most puzzling questions is how do the laws of physics control what happens in the universe? Do they exist in some platonic space and reach down to the material world or not? In what way do they apply? Because that's incredibly relevant to this idea of coming into being of the universe. Theories like Hawking and Blottenlow 
somehow assume that the laws of physics existed before the universe existed. They deny that, but that's actually what they are assuming. So where did the laws exist, and what way did they exist before the universe came into being? That's one of the crucial questions which somehow they don't really tackle. Now, related to this is mathematics, because physics is a mathematical theory, and one of the deep issues is how does mathematics relate to physics? But one of the things we can say, at least most of us believe, is that mathematics exists out there in a way which doesn't depend on culture, time, space, probably doesn't even depend on the existence of the universe, that mathematics exists in some kind of eternal platonic space uh, out there. And I want to talk about that in just a minute. There are two big issues. The existence of possibility spaces for physical existence and for mental existence. Now, the laws of physics create the possibility of physical existence. Okay, they just, in the sense that once things have come into being, they, they, they create, they describe the possibilities of what can happen, of the kinds of things that can happen. All that comes into existence is foreshadowed and allowed by possibility space for physical existence, the laws of physics. The laws of physics describe what is possible and what isn't. For instance, you can't violate energy conservation, you can't violate momentum conservation. No matter what happens, that's written into the laws of physics which determines this possibility space of behavior on a football field, in driving a motor car, whatever, you can't violate the laws of conservation of momentum, conservation energy. So there's a possibility space of possible ways you can drive, which is governed by the laws of physics. Now, equally, there's laws of biological existence, the landscape of evolutionary theory. Some animals are possible and some are not. Like you can't have a pig which is 20 feet long because it would fall flat on its face because of the scaling laws of physics. Animals have to have an energy intake and output. You can't create an animal which doesn't have energy coming, going on. So there's all sorts of constraints on what is possible for animals. That's the possibility space of biological existence. But the, one of the most interesting ones, there's a possibility space for thoughts. Because, in fact, the brain is a finite system. The brain can only have a finite possible number of thoughts, and the thoughts that you can think are somehow written into a possibility space of possible thoughts. This is the space of possible logic which existed again before the universe came into being. And we discover some of the thoughts that we could have, but we can't think thoughts which aren't possible thoughts. And so there is a space of possible thoughts somehow in some sense underlying the universe just as there is a space of possible physics and a space of possible, um, of possible biology. And in fact, there has to be a space of possible emotions, possible meanings and possible values which I'll come back to in just a minute. Just let, me, let me just take mathematics as an example. It's a case of a platonic world of mathematical abstractions which we learn about through our human minds. Mathematics is causally effective because it creates patterns on paper, it creates, it's used in physics, it's used in engineering, commerce, and planning in general. Mathematics somehow exists, waiting to be discovered. We discover it, we use it, it changes life in the world around us. Major parts of mathematics are discovered, not invented. For instance, the fact that the square root of two is irrational was discovered by the Greeks and it dismayed them to discover it. They didn't want to discover it. It was not a social invention. It was something about the nature of mathematical reality which they discovered. Now, we're convinced all mathematicians throughout the entire universe will discover that the square root of two is irrational. It's got nothing to do with culture, time, or place. What that means is, the way I would express it, there's a platonic world of mathematical realities which we discover, and that is the world of possible logic of mathematical arguments. This, these spaces have an abstract rather than embodied character. You can't determine mathematics by physical experiments. You determine it by logical experiments, and they are independent of the existence and culture of human beings. In fact, they would have pre-existed the universe in my view, they must have pre-existed the universe if Hawking and Rodinlow were right that the laws of physics pre-existed the universe because the laws of physics assume the laws of mathematics. So these basic geometrical features, the number pi is somehow written into the fabric of reality in an eternal, unchanging way. Okay? The same result for the number pi will be discovered near Alpha Centauri on the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, Pythagoras' law will be discovered by people out there. And this, the 
fractal, Mandelbrot set, was waiting to be discovered. People didn't invent it. They didn't, it isn't a social construction. It was sitting waiting to be discovered until we had computers powerful enough to print the set out, and it then surprised everybody. We could understand it after we'd seen it. Nobody predicted that this would exist. It was a discovery in the journey of ex exploring the mathematical landscape. So the key issue is the coming into existence of things that make these, these possibilities real. The universe, the laws and powers that underlie the existence of life. What makes the specific laws fly? We have the possibility space and then we have a particular set of the possibilities that's realized, these two things. But the deepest thing, the really deep thing, is why the possibility spaces exist. Where do they come from? What do they express about the nature of the universe? Where does it come from that these kind of entities have any possibility of existence, of matter, of mathematics, of thoughts of a specific kind? What kind of pre-existence allows their actual existence? Because my claim is that, for instance, mathematical theorems can't come into existence unless their possibility was already somehow embedded, embedded into the structure of reality, just as the laws of physics are. As I said, there's a finite space of thoughts and possible reasoning. We could talk about this a little bit, but the, the, the possible length of a meaningful sentence is finite. It is not infinite, despite what some theories of linguistics may say. Why is there any logical basis for things at all? Why are there laws of logic which underlies what happened? The logic is a possibility space for what can happen. And so the claim I'm making is that before the universe came into being, or maybe with it, but I would think before, if there's any sense in which the universe came into being on the basis of something which in some sense pre-existed, the laws of possibilities had to exist, okay? Because that determines the laws of mathematics, that determines what physics is possible, because what physics is possible is determined by what mathematics is possible. But then the really big question then is, I claim that also as well as these possibilities of physics and mathematics, possibility of ethical behavior must have been there pre-existing the universe also, the possibility of good values and bad values. In fact, so I take the view of an ethical realism, which is basically saying there's also a space of ethical possibilities with a value system there, what is good and what is bad. And the really funny thing about this is that Richard Dawkins and Victor Stenger actually also believe in a moral reality, but they don't realize that they do. And I think that's quite funny. Richard Dawkins and Victor Stenger have written about how Christianity, religion is evil. Now. One can debate about that. Many evil things have happened for religion, but the point I'm making here is Dawkins and Stenger believe there are absolute values by which you can judge if religion is evil or not. And they haven't thought about where they get their values from, but I claim that what they are assuming is universal, cultural independent, space and time independent values of what is good and what is bad. In other words, I claim that they are thinking there is in fact a moral reality out there by which they can judge the goodness or badness of religion. And of course, I believe, I completely agree, I believe in ethical realities, and I wrote about this in my book with Nancy Murphy called On the Moral Nature of the Universe. And so what I think pre-existed the universe is not merely laws of physics and mathematics, but also ethical laws, laws that stated what is good, and well, I wouldn't call them laws, a space of ethical possibilities, including some sort of value system on that space, judging what is good and what is not. Now let me read this to you. I say to myself as I watch the niece, who is very beautiful, in her this bread is transmuted into melancholy grace, into modesty, into a gentleness without words. Sensing my gaze, she raised her eyes towards mine and seemed to smile, a mere breath on the delicate face of the waters, but an affecting vision. I sense the mysterious presence of the soul that is unique to this place. It fills me with peace and my mind with the words, this is the peace of silent realms. I have seen the shining light that is born of the wheat. That's from Anton Zupere, Flight to Eris. I find that an absolutely wonderful in feeling, a, a spirit in that. The question is, where did the possibility of that kind of expression come from? How is it possible that there could be something like that in the universe? 
The possibility of coming into being of the quality expressed in this text cannot in any plausible way, I suggest, arise out of purely physical interactions alone. There's a higher level of meaning that this kind of interaction by itself than that the physical kind of interactions by themselves can engage with. I think there is a quality of meaning which is quite undeniable, and you see it in art, in literature, and in interactions which involve ethical things, which in no way can be encompassed in any physical thing as being implied in any sense by physics, chemistry, microbiology. David Albert, I guess, talking again about Christ, it ought to be mentioned, quite apart from the question of whether anything Christ says turns out to be true or false, that the whole business of approaching the struggle with religion as if it were a card game or a horse race or some kind of battle of wits just feels all wrong, or it does at any rate to me. When I was growing up, where I was growing up, there was a critique of religion according to which religion was cruel and a lie and a mechanism of enslavement and something full of loathing and contempt for everything essentially human. Maybe that was true, maybe it wasn't, but it had to do with important things. It had to do that as with history and suffering and with the hope of a better world. And it seems like a pity and more than a pity and worse than a pity with all that lies in the back of one's head to think that all that gets, that all that gets offered to us now by guys like these and books like these is the pale, small, city, ner nerdy accusation that religion is, I don't know, dumb. And he's saying that the kinds of arguments that are being put in these books don't begin to get into the kind of territory from which you can argue about ultimate meaning, but that's what they're claiming to do. So is the ultimate reason for the universe pure chance or probability or necessity or purpose? Those are the four options and they're all logically possible. It could be chance, pure chance, not probable, just chance. It could be that it's probable, it could be it's necessary, it could be there's some purpose or meaning lying behind it. David Hume emphasized that science cannot prove any of these right and cannot prove any of them wrong, and that is still true. Neither science nor philosophy can give a certain answer. Metaphysical uncertainty remains. And anybody, whether it's Hawking or Mlodino or anybody else who says science can prove that one of these is right, simply doesn't understand philosophy. If one wants to relate to deeper meaning of personal life, the last option has the most traction. The others in the end provide a more tentative relation to morality and meaning, but we do have experience of morality and meaning do exist in the world. We experience them in our daily lives. And one of the points about all of this is that the multiverse does not solve this problem because the multiverse simply pushes the problem back. So the multiverse is supposed to explain why this universe is the way it is. Let's suppose the multiverse is a true explanation of this universe. Let's just suppose that. All the same issues arise again. Did that multiverse arise by chance, probability, necessity, or purpose? The multiverse explanation, despite the way it's presented in those books, gives no ultimate answer for anything. It simply shifts it back one step, and the same ultimate issues remain. So the reprise, what kinds of questions do you want to answer? If you want to answer purely physical questions, physical cosmology will tell you all you want to know. And Lawrence's book is good on the physical cosmology. Why does human life exist? That's what I like to talk about, cosmology with a capital C and cosmology with a small c. Cosmology with a small c is just the physical stuff. Cosmology is the capital C, is you're going to talk about meaning. If you want to talk about cosmology with a small c, you can engage with physics and chemistry and so on, that's fine. If you want to talk about cosmology with a capital C, you can't do it on the basis just of physics. You must talk about meaning, morality, beauty, those kinds of things, or you're not even in the right ballpark to talk about those kinds of issues. If you want to talk about how it relates to purpose and meaning, is there just physical causation underlying it? You may claim after you've done it that there is only physical causation but in order to debate the thing, you must look at the evidence of all of these other things and not just look at the evidence from particle physics and from cosmology, or you're not even taking the relevant data into account. Actually, we do know there's more than physical causation at work in the universe. Purpose does exist and is causally effective. We know that. You must use models and data of adequate scope for the inquiry, which in this case must take into account the genuine existence of purpose and meaning, which we all experience in our daily lives. So don't claim purely physical arguments are necessarily sufficient 
to investigate issues of meaning. Can there be emergence of a totally new kinds of existence ex nihilo? Could the kind of quality that was in that reasoning emerge purely out of physics, purely out of the interactions of particles with each other? I don't believe that for one minute. Now, that's a philosophical statement. I can't prove it, but I believe that very, very profoundly. I think that the possibility of these meanings is preordained. There's a possibility space in which the possibility of that kind of expression was written before the universe began. In other words, I believe that there's some possibility of meaning pre-existing the universe as well as the possibility of physical laws, chemical laws, and biological laws. So can meaning really emerge out of non-meaning? I claim no, it has to be at least foreshadowed in some possibility space in neither physics nor multiverse solves these issues. That's my claim. It was a fascinating talk. At the end I was thinking how to summarize George's talk and imagine that I have invented how to do that. I, I would encapsulate the last part of George's talk in the following saying. Even a physicist does not believe in God. He knows that in creating the universe, God was thinking mathematically. <laughs> okay. So now we begin our discussion, please. Questions, comments, remarks. You have said that uh, some people develop uh, multiverse theory because of uh, philosophical reasons. Uh, but uh, isn't it true that uh, assuming the multiverse we at the same time admit that uh, there are some uh, physical reality uh, which lies totally beyond our perception. Not uh, uh, spiritual reality, but physical reality, uh, which uh, we people uh, won't be able to uh, describe in a physical, mathematical way. We won't be able to write an uh, equation or inequality. So, isn't it a good philosophical reason uh, to deny it? To deny the multiverse? Um, yes. I think one must recognize that the multiverse is a very reasonable philosophical explanation of what we see. It's a scientifically based philosophical explanation. So, um, I don't think one can shoot down the multiverse as being a philosophical explanation. I think it's a very reasonable philosophical explanation. I think it just should be stated that it's not provable and so in some sense or other is not a fully scientific theory. Now, Bill Sturger and I having a bit of debate about that, he says I'm a bit too strict about scientific <laughs> provability. Um, what Bill says, well maybe he should say it himself, is that if you have a chain of argumentation which is supported in many ways and there's which points to the multiverse, and the multiverse is the only possible explanation, then you have to believe it because it's the only possible explanation. But of course the question is how wide is the domain of possible explanations that you will allow? And the people who are saying this is the only possible explanation are of course excluding atheistic explanation as part of their possibility space. So that is the reason why it is a philosophical explanation. If you want to exclude a theistic um, explanation, you're perfectly entitled to do so, but you must state you're doing so on a philosophical basis and not on a scientific basis, because that's not a scientifically provable uh, position. Or perhaps I should... I think George, George is uh, correct about my view, but I would complement it with um, a further statement that I think that um, in order for multiverse to be te testable, from my point of view, it, it it's very, would be very difficult to test it, but it would have to be a theory that is not only the only explanation, but a theory that um, 
where the essential existence of a multiverse um, in, in a theory was uh, a theory w which had long-term scientific success. I mean, in other words, it provided a basis for a very rich um, expansion of science, and therefore it was a fertile, long-term successful theory. So um, I admit that it's not um, anything that would happen soon, but I could have envisioned that it could be. I mean, that's... So I, I don't think we disagree, George. It's just I think... Uh, we disagree in that I find it difficult to envision how it ever could. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Uh, do you see physical laws and mathematical laws in the possibility space not realized? Uh, well, differently, do you see physical laws as a subset of the possibility space of mathematics, or uh, do you think they're fundamentally different on a metaphysical level? Um, th there's two things. R let me just explain why I use the idea of the possibility space. It's because, again, I've been helped with this by Bill Stig. One could say that one's dealing with the laws of physics, that the laws of physics sit out there in a platonic space and reach down and affect things. The problem with that is there's this big debate about the nature of the laws of physics. Are they descriptive or are they prescriptive? And we, ha we, we really can't solve that one. Are they forcing matter to behave in a certain mathematical way? In which case the question is how do they achieve that? And somehow mathematics really does have a hold on the matter in the universe. That's the one kind of possibility. And one doesn't really understand where or how the laws of physics exist because the laws are not physical things. They're metaphysical things. The alternative is that they simply describe the way matters behave and they are very good descriptors of matters behave. But the problem with that is it's not then clear why all matter everywhere behaves the same way. We've looked over there to the surface of life scattering. We see the same behaviors over there. If the laws are merely descriptive, not prescriptive, we don't have any reason why the behavior of matter should be the same everywhere. And that's a very, very deep puzzle for that view of the descriptive rather than prescriptive. So that's why I talk about a possibility space. The possibility space is don't worry about the nature of the laws. Talk about what the laws allow. It's the same as in mathematics. You can talk about the differential equations or about the solution space. And the possibility space, it's very clear. The possibility space doesn't allow momentum. Momentum must be conserved and energy must be conserved and so on and so on. And so that's why I talk about the possibility space rather than the laws. And it's the same in biology. Biologists have found the possibility landscape a very fruitful image because they can talk about that rather than talking about the biological laws. Okay, given that, I see mathematics and physics as completely different. The mathematics is a logical structure. It's part of the possibility space of thoughts. It is not a possibility space of what happens because mathematics per se, by itself, does not have any handle to influence the universe unless the laws of physics are that handle in some way that we don't understand. By, by contrast, the laws of physics do control what happens in the universe or they describe it one or the other. Uh, most physicists, I, I tend to think very much that the laws of physics are real things in some abstract sense which then reach down and really affect the way that matters behave. And I think many physicists think that way. I think it's the philosophers who tend to more to go in the descriptive side. But so then you've got the laws of physics on the one hand as having real physical effects. You have the laws of mathematics which don't have a direct effect on matter unless they have the effect on matter through underlying the laws of physics, as Roger Penrose has suggested. The mind, however, can interact with this logical space and work out what the laws of mathematics must be. And so we can explore, we have explored part of the, law, the, the mathematical possibility space. The whole process of mathematics is extending the part of the mathematical possibility space that we've explored. Okay, can physics apply, I, I'm, I would be, very certain that there are parts of the laws of, of the space of mathematical pos possibilities which are not realized in physics. I would think that would be the case, although um, Max Tegmark thinks the opposite. Max Tegmark thinks that every possible mathematical structure is realized somewhere, somehow, in some universe. That's his philosophical position. 
it's an unprovable statement. My own position would be I would doubt that very much. I would believe that part of the mathematical possibility space is realized in the physics possibility space. Uh, it is interesting to notice that uh, Joseph Zyczyński's philosophy also was very similar. He, he, he spoke about the field of rationality, and this is something very close to your field of potentialities. Yeah. He also used that name, field of potentialities. So who, who, who was that? You Joseph said? Zyczyński, Archibald oh, yes, Zyczyński. Yes, 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 yes. He wrote extensively about that. Yes. Okay. In, uh, interestingly enough, in economics, um, um, uh, Sen, the Nobel Prize winner, talks about potentialities, mm -hmm. which is actually a very similar idea in economics. Yeah. Uh, Julian Barber. Uh, George, this isn't really going to disagree with the substance of your talk, but just on one point I would like to question you, and it's, uh, many people say it, that it's impossible that a unique thing should be describable by a law. You, you said that about the universe, that, that if it's that, unique... That a unique thing. Hmm? It's possible that a unique thing could be described by a law. Yes. Now, I would challenge that. First of all, um, the, uh, you may remember, it, well, Lee Smolin and I developed Leibniz's idea that we live in the universe that is, we live in a universe that is more varied than any other one. Now, we realized this in that diagram I showed you in that conference at Yale, uh, where there is a diagram where if you look at it long enough, you say there's an unambiguous law which creates that, that structure. It is more varied than any other arrangement that you could have. So that's a timeless, that's a single example where you can unambiguously say this is the law that, that, so to speak, created it. Now, in the case of ordinary dynamics, let's just take the Newtonian n-body problem. It's now where you have it evolving in, in time, or what we call time. Anyway, there's a curve in the configuration space, and you, can, you have then multiple repetitions where you just take at each point you find that there's a point and a tangent vector determines the future evolution of the curve. And wherever you go along, you can just pick up a point and a tangent vector, you find exactly the same law, so that it, in a sense it's completely determined. I, I think that's not an issue of the problem of, of saying what the law of a unique object is, either with or without time. But I don't think this has any great impact on, on the totality of your talk, which I enjoyed very much <laughs> and largely approved of, George. <laughs> Um, the, you, the older members of the audience may remember that um, Herman Bondi, well, that in cosmology in the old days there was something called the cosmological principle, which was taken as the founding principle of cosmology. It's in Bondi's book, it's in Weinberg's 1973 book. There's a fascinating section in Weinberg's book where he tries to argue why the cosmological principle must be a law which applies to the universe. I'm sure that he doesn't want to be reminded that that's there because it's absolutely the opposite of his position. Now, it was assumed as a foundational principle of cosmology that there was a law which applied to the universe. Now, that's gone out of the window now. Most physicists now assume that the laws which apply in the universe apply to the universe, which is a very, very strange assumption. That's what we're seeing in this thing, that they're assuming that the laws which you determine in the universe apply to the universe. But in any case, from my viewpoint, it's, it's just very, very simple. The whole concept of a law is that it's a regularity statement about which tells you how a whole series of entities will behave. And if there's one entity, you can't have a law because there's only one entity. All you can do is describe it. That's all you can do. But, but I just said the entity is the point in, in phase space. George. Which maximizes something. The, the, the point in phase space is yeah. the entity. And you've got all the points in the one phase space which correspond to the same classical history. I talked to Herman Bondi about this, making the claim, exactly your claim, okay. and, and he, I think he did agree with me in the end that it, that's not true. You've got multiple vind verifications of the same law holding. Okay. Well, so underlying this is the assumption that this phase space exists and is real in some platonic sense. I was in the point of phase space this morning, and I'm in a point of phase space this afternoon. That, that's a law in the universe. You're trying to apply it to the universe. <laughs> I'm saying that same law is describing the universe. That's those a... Two real, those two yeah. Moments. Okay. Well, so my statement would be, if it is a law that applies to the universe, it's not provable that it is a 
It's, there, there's no way that that can be proved because you can't rerun the universe with different initial conditions. You can't look at other universes. So if there is a law which applies to the universe, there's no way to prove there's a law that applies to the universe because it's not a testable scientific proposition. <laughs> Please. You said at one, one moment that the space of thought is, is somehow limited. Yeah. Naively, I would think it's unlimited. Can you expand on that a bit? Yeah. Um, linguistic Undetermined, theory... Undetermined, but limited. Um, the point is that a thought has a start and it has to have an ending. If it has no ending, it isn't a complete thought. Now, the point about infinity is you never, ever get to the end. So if you have the sentence which was 100,000 million, 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 million words, you haven't begun on the road to infinity. A real sentence, you have to remember the end of the beginning of the sentence by the time you reach the end of the sentence. So a real word, <laughs> in fact, um, it's, it's, in fact, for a usable sentence, the maximum for a usable sentence is something like 900 words because your short-term memory can't hold more than that in your short-term memory. So you can say, well, there are other possible animals out there who might have bigger short-term memory. The size of animals is also limited. The size of potential animals can't be indefinite either. In fact, sentences are about conveying meaning and they cannot continue forever because if they continue forever, they never close the thought of the meaning they are conveying and so they, it's not a logical concept. People tend to use the name infinity when they mean a very large number. They are completely different things. They are nothing like each other. The point about infinity, you never, ever, ever get there. It's an unattainable thing. And a sentence which can never be completed isn't a sentence in any realistic sense of the word. So that means that you don't claim that there is just finite number of possible thoughts. Yeah. The, the tyrann, um, are you saying that or are you saying that just one... Um, I'm saying thing? there's a finite number of possible thoughts. One of the reasons also is that the brain is a finite instrument. There's a finite number of possible connections in the brain. There's 10 to the 13 cells. So there's 10 to the something or 10 to the 13 factorial kind of connections. That's the maximum number of connections All you right. can have in your brain. So you cannot... <laughs> If thoughts are encoded in the brain, the fact that a brain must be finite in size prevents there being an infinite number of possible thoughts. Probably, but you know, you, you can have finite piece of something and it contains well, infinite number of points, right? Uh, well, you see, I would, like Julian Barber, I, as soon as you say infinite number of points, I say that's not physics, that's, that's, that's mathematics, but it doesn't correspond to anything in the real world. I claim that do not exist an infinite number of anything along with David Hilbert. In fact, the worst infinity of all is the claim that between my fingers there's an uncountable infinity of points. That cannot possibly be true in physical reality, which is why I believe that space-time is discrete. <laughs> Julian, one small. Julian. Just to come back to that thought you, you were saying about the number of connections in our brain, George. Yeah. When you're listening to an absolutely fantastic performance of a Beethoven quartet, is that finite? Yeah. Because, or is it that they're tapping into something which is actually infinite. The word the, inf the, 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 is, is, is the universe infinite? Is God infinite? Spinoza and, and uh, uh, Leibniz? Uh, I uh, mean, the, the, there is this absolutely magical thing that happens in, 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 in music and yeah. all great art yeah. when it's performance. Yeah. Complete spontaneity. Yeah. It does not depend on the bra what's going on in the brain of one of the players. It depends often on Somebody has a spontaneous thought to take things in a slightly different way, and suddenly everybody who, every professional musician I've ever spoken to says exactly the same. They never attempt to repeat magical moments from a previous evening. Yeah. It comes totally spontaneously and yeah. utterly mysteriously. Yeah. This is the magic of the now. Yeah. And I'm not so <laughs> sure that that is evidence for finiteness, George. I think it's evidence possibly 
It's only tentative evidence for infinity, but the thrill I personally experience inclines me to believe really in, in infinite possibilities. Well, if you do believe in infinite possibilities, I'm, what you're assuming is that mental states are not determined by brain states, because brain states are finite. Oh, absolutely, I agree. I, I, don't, think, I don't think my brain is, is a closed system. I think my brain, after all, I'm interacting with you now, George, so it can't be just the neurons in my brain that is producing the words that are coming out of my mouth now. Well, this, this leads us into a very deep discussion <laughs> in I another think. area. Okay. But, 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 but the point is that the po you can analyze what's happening in the brain. You can take with modern... Com you can take all the possible connections, all the possible oscillations which can happen over the course of your lifetime, and that's a finite number of possibilities. Now, the only way you can get around that is by saying that you're going to believe that mental states are not determined by brain states. You can believe that, but you'll be out of tune with all of current day neuroscience. But e even the number of thoughts is infinite, we cannot ex exhaust all of them now. <laughs> Please. It seems that infinity is one of the fundamental concepts of modern science. Of but, modern science? Yeah. Uh, but there's a, a, some mystery behind the very concept of infinity. Uh, how do you think, was the concept invented or discovered? Infinity? Yeah. Each um, answer is... Yeah. Uh, All right, that's a very interesting question. My position on the mathematics is that there is at least some mathematics which is not invented. I'm not sure if infinity lies in the invented or the not invented class. I'm, 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 I'm not prepared. What I do say is that most of the really serious logical problems in mathematics arise from allowing infinity into your scheme. And that I think some people have tried this, but you see, I think that mathematics should be done without infinities, and I think you would have far less logical problems. For the mathematicians, the point is the following. The move from calculus to analysis got rid of infinity. Instead of saying limit n goes to infinity, you replaced it by epsilon and deltas. That was what led to a higher level of mathematics, was removing infinity from analysis, from calculus and changing to analysis. And I think the same is true in physics. One should remove infinity from physics, you will get a deeper understanding of what is going on. Just a technical little point on this. In terms of general relativity and boundary conditions of infinity, I have replaced this in my writing by talking about what I call a finite infinity, that you should put your boundary conditions for a finite system at a finite distance, which is for all practical purposes infinity, but it is not infinity, and that makes all the difference in the world. Other questions? Bill? Just one comment about infinity, and that there are some people, some philosophers, and I, I tend to agree with them, that make a distinction between mathematical infinity and metaphysical infinity. In other words, that when the discussion we've been having here about infinity I, is talking mainly, mainly about, or pri exclusively about mathematical infinity, but Metaphysical infinity, according to these philosophers, would be um, the idea of, of plenitude. I mean, like talking about uh, the divine, about God as being infinite. You're not talking about God as being mathematically infinite, but being sort of metaphysically infinite. I'll hand that over to the philosophers and theologians. <laughs> I think it was the point of Cantor himself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm completely on your side that in physics there is no infinity and everything is discrete. And uh, also with this that in mathematics a real progress actually, for example, going from calculus to analysis uh, appeared when, when you moved, I would say, from actual infinity to potential infinity. Yes, absolutely. This is the, yeah. But there is still a philosophical problem. Why this potential, even potential infinity in mathematics, is enough to explain the physical phenomena, which are not infinite, which are discrete, and so on, so on. Yeah. So this is the problem, okay? Yeah. Thank you. No comment? <laughs> Please.
what do you think of Everett's interpretation of quantum physics? Do you think that uh, uh, when uh, quantum physics predicts the probabilities of different possibilities, do these possibilities coexist uh, each uh, in its own universe? Uh, yeah, you, you're, you're putting forward the kind of the David Deutsch view of quantum physics. Um, no, I don't believe in that at all. I believe in a real collapse of the wave function um, related to real quantum events which are equivalent to measurements. Um, I think quantum physics has been hampered by the relation of the collapse of the wave function to experiments or measurements when in fact I think it happens all the time all over the place. It does not have to be related to experiments. That experiments are particular cases, measurements are particular cases of collapse. I think it happens far more widely than that all the time. And I don't think that the multiverse position, the Deutsch position, helps. George, I'm completely on board with your critique of the grandiose claims made on behalf of, of multiverse theories of quantum cosmology to settle uh, th long-standing theological questions at one fell swoop. I think, I think you've got that exactly right, as Albert, the reviewer yeah. of Krauss's book, argued. Um, but I'm curious about your estimate of the prospects for a scientifically based multiverse theory. You mentioned three ways of motivating the multiverse view. Yeah. The first was that uh, it might fall out of our best current account of the origination of our universe. Yeah. The second was that all possibilities are actual, this yeah. idea we were just thinking about. So, yeah. And the third was it's a way, it's a kind of last desperate expedient to avoid fine tuning. And, so and, in, and in particular to explain the value of the cosmological constant, that's a whole little sub-discourse we could go right. into. So let's set aside those second two. I'm curious about your estimate of the first. That is, could one of these folks make the case that, uh, the, that the, the best account we current, or at least a plausible account that we would currently give of how our universe would arise would entail at least the possibility if not the probability of a whole set of other universes arising through the very same processes. That would seem to be an extrapolation of physics and not uh, a, a, a philosophically motivated attempt to avoid fine tuning. Well, you're saying it is an extrapolation of the physics. Well, I'm wondering about your, your estimate. Of yeah, those no, three no, no. possibilities, it seems to me your critique is really effective against the second and the third. Yeah, um, I'm curious about your estimate of the first. Well, you see, there, there are actually the multiverse, it's a multi-headed thing. Um, in um, Brian Greene's book, he, he, he lists nine different kinds of multiverses, okay? So it's a multi-headed kind of thing. Um, but for instance, the one which Leonard Suskin supports, which is tunneling um, from one vacuum state into... And that, that process is a generalization of what happens in solid state physics. It's a huge extrapolation from solid state physics to saying this happens in the context of gravity. Now, that is, is a general extrapolation which may or may not be true. And it has not been tested. There's no way, I believe, of testing that it is true. What you'd have to do is devise some experiment to show that this process which... Um, Suskin suppose happens actually happens in order to test it. And I don't think you can do that. I think it's an extrapolation. Far more important is something which Jean Philippe has emphasized for me, which is that what you have to have is not just these multiple domains, but you also have to have physics different in these multiple domains. So now in order to get that, you need a theory which allows physics to be different. And this is where the string th landscape theory comes in, which that's a highly speculative theory. But then you have to link the two together and that is another element of speculation. So there are three different speculations from the physics side, all of which are untestable, and in fact, none of which are. Uh, and so it's multiple layers of speculation which lead to it. So I, I, I would say that is, it's going to be very difficult indeed to make that into a testable physical theory. Jean-Philippe, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> No, I think it's, I agree with you. I think it's, I, I don't see how you can today construct a, a fully consistent uh, multiverse model. 
But I think there are different arguments for different kind of multiverse that may exist, like the one coming from the string landscape. But this idea, for instance, even if you are not able to construct a full uh, model of the multiverse, you can exclude this hypothesis. I mean, it, you just have to go through the whole vacuum state that they say that you have in this theory, 10 to the power 500, and see that, and just check that none of these vacuum correspond to the low energy physics we have today. One thing we don't know because they want to explain the value of the cosmological constant, but this is not all. You want to explain, like, you have SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, and all the fundamental constants take correct value. And there may be correlations between all these things, which do not guarantee that in this space of possibilities, our own universe is a point. And this is something that you believe is the case, because you have a large number, but it's not a proof. So in principle, if you can enumerate by some kind of uh, computer code or whatever, all this space of possibility and say, what is the low energy physics? If you don't find a universe which is close to our universe, then yeah. this, this explanation has, is ruled out. So you can rule out some realization of these ideas, yeah. even if you don't know the exact construction. And but what, what I want to say here is physicists have lowered their standards of explanation. And Margaret Wertheim, I put up a quote there on a the board from a book called Physics on the Fringe, Smoke Rings, Circlons, and Alternative Theories of Everything. And it's a wonderful quote from Margaret Wetter. She started talking to a guy who had a circlon theory of gravity. Now, there have been thousands of these theories of gravities by cranks. And she went to a meeting of these cranks where they all got together and sort of put their theories to each other. And she then went to a meeting of the top theoretical physicists at Santa Barbara. And look what she says. The string cosmology conference I attended was by far the most surreal physics event I've ever been to. A star-studded proceeding involving some of the most famous names in science. Hawking was there and Weinberg was there and so on. After two days, I couldn't decide if the atmosphere was more like a children's birthday party or the Mad Hatter's tea party. In either case, everyone was high. The attitude among the string cosmologists seemed to be that anything that wasn't logically disallowed must be out there somewhere. Even things that weren't allowed couldn't be ruled out because you never knew when the laws of physics might be bent or overruled. This wasn't students fantasizing in some late-night beer-fueled frenzy. It was the leaders of theoretical physics speaking in one of the most prestigious university campuses in the world. That's Margaret Wertheim. You've met Margaret Wertheim. And the thing about it, just to give another flavor of this, in Brian Greene's book, he has nine possible multiverses. One of the ones he lists is the possibilities that we're living in a computer simulation. And Nick Bostrom has written stuff about this, and they've just had a, a kind of a presentation of this somewhere near New York by a group of philosophers. I cannot imagine why anybody seriously proposes when they're not drunk that we're living in a computer simulation. I do not know why it is worth the time to talk about it. And th what Margaret says there is right, that p theoretical physicists are allowing themselves a kind of a free range of fantasy where they have let go of the standard constraints of physics. There is no way, if you understand the embodied nature of the mind, that we could be a computer simulation. But supposing we were, where does this computer exist? Who built it? How did it come into existence? What sort of universe did it come into? It raises so many more questions that are unexplained that it takes you backwards in explanatory explanation, not forwards. And yet that's in Brian Greene's book as one of the options of the multiverse. I think that really the, 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 the level of testing, the level of scientific rigor has actually gone down in a lot of these discussions. Okay, <clears throat> uh, let's stick to some experimental question. <laughs> okay, because we are talking about the multiverse, and uh, this uh, re is really abstract. But suppose that you could see the evidence on the past light cone yeah. that uh, the quasar spectra uh, are so that the alpha, the fine structure constant, uh, varies yeah. different, very strongly yes. from the value which uh, yes. we know yeah. uh, now. Uh, and uh, perhaps there was another point. Would you then believe that the idea of multiverse is yeah. okay. okay or not? I mean, I, I would like to perhaps uh, make a kind of a comparison. Uh, 
Okay, because in physics sometimes you, you are surprised, okay? We are theoretical physicists and we sometimes think of a very strange uh, entity. For example, I could give an example which is uh, from particle physics, okay? Before the discovering of the confinement, quark confinement, I think people would not believe there is, that there was something like confinement, that the strength of, uh, of the, uh, I mean, the, the force was uh, actually diminishing with the size, okay? Before people were thinking, yeah. I mean, having the experience, experience from electrodynamics. So um, I think that would perhaps, we still could think of something, yeah. uh, some laws which are variable uh, and uh, I think that something should, this should somehow yeah. be taken into account. Okay. Um, the, let me slightly step back and say there's one case where the multiverse can be disproved and there's one case where I would regard there as being evidence that it is possibly true. The case where it's been disproved could be disproved as what I call a small universe. This is the idea that the universe is smaller than the visual horizon. Now the implication of that is we see the same galaxy in different directions in the sky. We can see around the entire universe. Now, that is a possible situation. In fact, there are observational tests of that. John Philippe has looked at it in some detail. If we ever proved we lived in a small universe, that would convincingly disprove almost all multiverse theory. So there is a possibility of disproof. But if we don't see a small universe, that doesn't mean the multiverse is true. But that is the, so in that particular situation would disprove most of the multiverse proposals. Okay. Now, on the other side, you're absolutely right. There is one thing which I would find moderately convincing, and that is the following. The idea that there, in these universe bubbles, the laws of physics are different, and then they collide with each other, and then you see a circle in the sky in which the fine structure constant is different within that circle from outside that circle. If we ever saw something like that, I would have to say this is evidence that there are two bubbles in the universe. And that is convincing evidence that a mechanism which creates separate bubbles is out at work there. Now, um, Jean-Philippe again has looked at this. What, and say something about it, Jean-Philippe. <laughs> Well, this is the beauty of theoretical physics. You can construct many models to, to, to back up many arguments. So I would say that if you were seeing like the, the fine structure constant with two different values in two different regions of space, for me it will not be a proof of the existence of multiverse. I can, I can just construct such a model. Actually, we did one with Keith Olive and, and Marco Peloso. We had a, a domain wall and then this is what I call a micro landscape. So this is just, we have uh, uh, physics underneath the standard physics and basically there are phase transitions and what you think is fundamental is actually not fundamental physics. So you have some kind of zone with different value of this, this quantity in our bubble volume. So this is possible to do. On the other hand, if I was saying another bubble and you can show that there is a number of spatial dimension is different there, I would suggest that maybe this is a, you know, like this kind of issues. Because I don't expect, I mean, there were papers where they were seeing slight uh, indication for bubble collisions. It was a slight modification of physics. In the multiverse, each bubble have completely different number of physics, different number of, of quark flavors, of symmetry, of spatial dimension. There is not a single reason so that the bubble you collide with is very, uh, as a physics, very close to the one yeah. in which you are living so, today. So, in order for such an argument to, to really give a hint toward the multiverse, I would, I, I, would, I would need to have a very strong physical, you know, like sharp gradients of, of some physical but, parameters. Otherwise, yeah. I, I'm sure I can construct field theory models that will explain this. But John philippe if, if the physics was really different, then this collision wouldn't be a minor perturbation. It would be a major catastrophe. Exactly, this is what I'm saying. I mean, it, it wouldn't be a tiny thing you'd have to search for. There would be major regions of the sky which would look completely different. Yes. Yeah. Which we don't see. <laughs> I'm afraid we must slowly come to the close of our discussion. <laughs> Perhaps one last question. Marius? Uh, okay, but uh, I, I wouldn't agree that it's totally untestable, okay? T 
totally untestable, at, at least what Jean-Philippe is doing, okay? No, no, what he's doing is yeah. fantastic yeah. physics. So I think, in principle, it's testable, but very... Okay, <laughs> I challenge you to put forward a funding proposal for observing the multiverse and to get funding from the <laughs> NRF. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, in principle, we must end our discussion.